Okay, first part of the oral exam, they're going to ask you about the meter and some parts. Um, so we're going to hit this here, the regulator, and uh, you may be asked the incoming pressure, 55 psi from the street, and it leaves that regulator at 7 inch of water column. That one you'll definitely be asked about, 7 inches of water column. Stays at 7 inches of water column all the way through the meter. Um, next we want to address is the index here where the dials are right there uh, quarter foot dial on the left one foot dial on the right on the bottom here um, and what that's for is for metering the amount of gas uh, going into the building uh, next thing you'll be asked here is uh, this valve here the A9 valve can we turn it on and off all we want the answer is yes we can um, we can turn that on and off all we want and this one down here the riser valve uh, they'll ask you about that one and that one can only be turned off in emergency uh, uh, the gas supplier has to turn it back on next you might be asked about the pressures for pressure testing in Spokane it's 10 psi for 15 minutes and what else could they ask you on the meter here? Uh, meter verification test or registering the meter. All that means is to let some gas out at some point by opening the A9 valve and make sure the dials actually spin, make sure the meter works. So now we'll move on to the purging process. Okay, so for the purge process, you're gonna start with a gauge like this attached on the meter end of the pipe because again, we can't pressure test the meter. It won't take that 10 PSI. Uh, 30 pound gauge on the meter end. So you're gonna take that off and hook your pipe into the meter. And then over here on this end, you're gonna have a cap, but the cap can't, we can't pressure test the flex, so it'll actually be down there um, by where the gas shutoff is. Um, typically this flex is up here closer. Um, this is just for demo purposes. So you'll take off that cap You'll finish piping this into the furnace on this side and again take off your gauge outside and finish piping into the meter. Then you want to slowly turn on the A9 valve and if you notice I already have this gas cock down here closed, this red thing over here, that guy. And you'll slowly turn on the A9 valve and then you'll come over here and physically separate this flex or union whatever it is you're putting on there so physically separate that open it up take this flex apart turn on your gas cock and then let that flow until you got gas coming out and leave it flowing while you tighten it down. That way you know you're purged all the way up to your flex. And then make sure the last thing you do is tighten that back down. Now you guys didn't hear any flow because I have the gas shut off here at the school, but that's the process. Slowly turn on the A9 valve and then di uh, disconnect your union or your flex. And then turn on your gas cock and once you got gas coming out, screw that back down tight. Um, and there's three ways you can tell there's gas and you have to say all three for the test. You can smell for gas, you can listen for the pitch change, which we already discussed. It'll go higher pitched. And then uh, you can also use a CGI, electronic sniffer, combustible gas indicator. And then that concludes the purge process. And don't forget, when you're purging propane, you need to ventilate the area really well, or you need to purge it to the outdoors. Now, soaping the line. It's a simple question. They ask you, what are you gonna soap and why? We're soaping the line to check for leaks. That's a given. The why is, or is to check for leaks. What you're soaping is everything that you 
hooked up or messed with or touched, whatever adjective you want to throw in there. But the key to that is that wasn't already part of the pressure test or the air test. So everything that I added or opened or, you know, that line we opened up when we purged, um, this pipe over here that we hooked up uh, into the furnace, all the pipes on the outside after we took our gauge off, but you don't have to soap the stuff in the middle because it's all already been air tested. So the best answer for soaping is everything that we messed with that wasn't part of the pressure test. That's your best answer for that. Okay, so spot check. They might say, what is a spot check? Or they might say, tell me how to use the meter to check for leaks. So all we're doing is, we're gonna come out to the meter here. We're gonna mark this quarter foot dial, the smaller one here. Um, then we're gonna go away for some amount of time. And then we're gonna come back and we're gonna make sure that that quarter foot dial didn't move. If it moved, it means you have a leak. Obviously with nothing running, you wanna do this. So everything's shut off but all the gas is turned on, come and mark the quarter foot dial, then come back a while later, make sure that quarter foot dial hasn't, hasn't moved. That's called a spot check. You may also hear them ask you, tell me how to use the meter to check for leaks. Um, it's a good idea to do this while you're soaping. So what I do in the field is I come and I check my dial, mark it, take a picture of it, whatever you gotta do to mark where it's at. And then I go and soap all that stuff we talked about earlier that we need to soap. And that usually burns a good five, 10 minutes worth of soaping. And then assuming you got no bubbles, you come back out and your quarter foot dial should be right where you left it. So that's spot check. Okay, I have to go handheld on my camera for a second. So I apologize, it's gonna be jittery. They're gonna ask you about hooking up the manometer and adjusting the gas valve. So on this one, and I'll show you guys a different one. You can see this stub right here sticking up but that's actually your incoming pipe. See, that's your incoming gas, that's your seven inch side. So that's not the stub you wanna put your manometer on when you're adjusting and clocking the meter. Um, their stub for your manometer is actually hiding back here. See if I can see it, there it is. Right down here behind the solenoid. It's that stub right there. Now this thing with the brass cap on it, I showed you guys that the first week. Underneath that brass cap is your adjustment and you turn it right to increase, left to decrease, or in to increase, uh, out to decrease, and you'll see that change on your manometer, and you can see that little stub right here. This is where you would put your manometer, right here by that adjustment. Now some of them have like a big Allen head screw. This one doesn't have it, but some of them will have a big Allen head screw over here on the manifold side. I'll show you one that has it. But again, this one's hiding. If you see this little stubby, so what you're looking for is this stub right here. If you see that stub on your gas valve, then you know that your adjustment's back here, back behind the solenoid, right there. Or sorry, that's your manometer hookup right there. There's a little screw inside there that you take loose. It's like a needle valve. And you put your manometer hose right over that nub. And then this is your adjustment right here under that cap. There'll be a plastic adjustment screw uh, in to increase out to decrease. And I'll show you another gas valve here in a second, another style with the big Allen head plugs. Okay, so now this is a different style gas valve. You see over here, we have this Allen head screw right here. You'll take that out and then your manometer has an adapter that goes in that hole. But again, this is the inlet side. So this isn't where you wanna put your manometer. You wanna put your manometer over here on this one. You see that one down there below my finger? Little Allen head screw. Now this one right here, don't worry about that. This is a special gas valve that's for a automatic pilot. That's just a plug, plug in the pilot hole. Your adjustment is not that. Your manometer goes here where the silver Allen head is. Your adjustment is not that. Your adjustment is actually on this one back here. It's hard to see with my camera angle here, but see if I can get it. It's actually right back here There we go. It's a silver, silver flat cap right in front of my finger there. Kind of looks like that brass one we messed with earlier, but, it, but it's silver. It's got a little flat head slot on it. You can actually see it right there. So that's your adjustment on this one. I'll show you a third one just for the heck of it. Okay, so here's your last style of gas valve, and this is the most common one. You see right here on the top, 
there's your little brass cap adjustment take off that cap underneath is that plastic adjustment in to increase out to decrease you see it's got that nub but that's not what that's for right here is that allen plug i talked about but again this is on the incoming pipe so that's the seven inch side so your manometer would go over here on this allen plug on the manifold side let's put the manometer right there now for this question they're going to ask you where do you put your manometer and where's the adjustment so you just go my manometer goes there my adjustments right here next question and then they'll ask you which way you turn it to increase and decrease clocking the meter okay so first you're gonna hook up your manometer where I already showed you and then you're gonna fire up the unit and you're gonna make sure that just the unit you want to clock is running and all other units are off you have your manometer already plugged in so you're gonna fire up the unit it's gonna read on your manometer then you're gonna come out here to the meter and you're gonna see all these dials spinning but the one we care about is the one foot dial the one I put a mark on right there Find the one foot dial, you'll see it spinning around, and you'll pick one of these tick marks on the upswing. So you'll have a downswing, it'll come down, then it'll start coming back up. So somewhere between six and midnight on the upswing, pick one of those tick marks, start a stopwatch. Let that one foot dial go all the way around one time, stop your stopwatch. Then your formula is 3600 divided by the amount of seconds that took to go around once, times a thousand okay safeties and parts I'm gonna do this on a different furnace than the one I have pictures of for class uh, just so that you guys can see a lot of this stuff is in the same place uh, this one up here doesn't have a vent safety switch so if, if you don't have that on the unit you're looking at you don't have to mention you only got to talk about the parts that you do have So this one up here doesn't have a vent safety switch so you're only gonna have five on this guy down here behind the door you always have a door switch okay so if we serpentine our way coming up we see right here in the burner we got this one wire thing there's a two wire thing over here but remember the two wire things the igniter this one wire thing that's the flame sensor so there's your next safety right there flame sensor so we got door switch flame sensor now as we come up here you see there's a switch right here on the face of this burner there's another one over here on the other side it has a little reset button in the middle it's not tripped but it's there these are your rollout switches so door switch flame sensor rollout switch over here now round it's got a hose on it a couple wires going to it this is your pressure switch um, and then last one we have is back here on the firewall this kind of tan brown looking thing back here that is your high limit and if you notice these are always where they belong always near the burners flame rollout always in the burner next to the near the igniter is your flame sensor always behind the door door switch always round with the hose pressure switch and always back on the firewall your high limit now we're going to talk about the long and short term startup and shutdown that you see on that sheet right there. So remember, long term is just referring to it's unsafe. You got to red tag it, lock it out for some reason. And we don't want the customer to figure out how to turn it back on while we're out getting that part to make the furnace safe again. So what we'll probably start with is the shutdown. So I'm going to end the call for heat. So this is the short term shutdown now. This is what happens every time the furnace shuts down at the end of its cycle. I'm going to end the call for heat. The thermostat's going to uh, tell the furnace to shut off. The first thing that's going to shut off is the flames. Those are going to go off. Then the combustion fan, the inducer fan, is going to keep running a little bit longer to do what we call a post purge. And you guys, like I said, you could just say to, get, to clear all the junk out. That's fine. That'll be acceptable. And then the last thing that happens is the big fan, the blower shuts off. So gas, inducer, then the blower. That's your order for your normal sequence of operations every time it shuts down off the thermostat. Once you let it go through that short-term shutdown, that thermostat shutdown, now we have to lock it out in some way so the uh, customer can't figure out how to turn it back on. 
So the safest first step is to turn off the switch on the side. Well, mine's plugged in the wall over here, but just pretend there's a switch on the side. Most furnaces, there always is. So turn off the switch on the side. Now nothing can happen. It's totally safe. So we killed the power in two places now, the thermostat and the switch. If you want to add a third one, you can kill the breaker. But you only got to say two of those. So the stat's off, the switch is off. Next, we want to shut off the gas in two ways. You don't have to cap the gas. All you do is you turn off the gas cock over here on the side. And again, mine's over there, so I don't want to go grab it. But turn off the gas cock on the side. And then this knob here, there'll either be a little flippy switch or there'll be a knob here that you can turn to the off position. Now that it'll never fire, even if they get the power back on, you have the gas valve turned off and you have the gas cock on the pipe turned off. And again, sometimes it's a switch instead of a knob. This one happens to be a knob. That's the on position, that's the off position. So now I've shut the gas down in two places. Well, a customer with YouTube might figure that out. Uh, so we gotta take it a little bit further. So another thing you might be able to do here is disable a safety some way. So maybe you can pull a wire off of like this vent safety up here, but make it look like it's still hooked up in some way so that the, it'll never fire because it has a limit open uh, and, then you, and the customer can't really tell unless they look really close that I took that wire off of there. So we put that wire back on. One of my favorite things to do is to take the pressure switch hose. You take the pressure switch hose and then it'll never run. And on this kind it's nice because the hose is hiding behind the pressure switch so the customer will never see that it's missing. So you gotta sabotage it in some way. So two power first then kill two gas and then sabotage it. That's your short and long term shutdown. Now for startup, um, you're going to do it in reverse order. So you're going to hook your safety back up or put your pressure switch hose back up. Um, whatever you disabled when you sabotaged it. Then you're going to get your two gases back on. So you're going to come back over here, you're going to get the gas cock back on, you're going to get this back on. Um, then you're going to go make it call for heat. Then you're going to stand to the side and turn the power on and you're going to watch it go through its startup sequence. So its startup sequence, remember IP if given four beers. So the inducer fan is going to come on first, it's going to start spinning. That's going to force the pressure switch to close. Then the igniter down here is going to start to glow uh, for four to seven seconds depending on the sequence timing of the furnace. but after the igniter glows and gets hot, now the gas valve is going to get energized and the flames are going to light. Then the flame sensor is going to sense that there's flame and tell the board so it can keep the gas on. And then the last thing that happens is the blower. IP if given four beers. Inducer, pressure switch, igniter, gas, flame sensor, blower. And I'll actually run it through a sequence here in a minute so you guys can see it start up. So you see the inducer fan came on, pressure switch got sucked closed. Now here in a sec, any second we should see that igniter start to glow. You'll see it down there kind of on the right. There we go. So down there on the right you got your nice little glow. Now you got your gas flame sensor senses that gas that it actually lit, tells the board it can stay burning, and then the last thing that's going to happen is my rattly fan's going to come on, the big blower. Okay, lastly, they're going to bring you over here to this natural draft furnace. They're going to ask you a few things on here. Um, we're going to start with spillage. So they're going to ask you, now they may not actually bring you over to this natural draft furnace. They might just have you just pretend it's natural draft on one of those 90 percenters over there. Um, 
So either way, you're going to have to imagine we have a draft hood here, okay? This is your draft hood. It goes clear across, all the way across this opening right here. Um, they're going to ask about spillage. They're going to say, what is spillage and how do we check for it? So what spillage is, is, is uh, gases, air, all that kind of stuff coming back down the vent and spilling out the hood here. And how do you check for it is you take a, a flame, like a candle, a lighter, uh, some powder, really light tissue paper, something like that. And while the unit is running, you're going to, um, and once draft is established, so the unit has to be on and warmed up and draft established. Um, that usually takes anywhere from one to four minutes uh, for the vent to get nice and hot and a natural draft to start being established. So once it's been warmed up, then you'll take a flame, match, sprinkle some powder, something like that, where you'll actually see it and you go corner to corner here with your flame and you'll actually see it get sucked into this draft hood all the way across the draft hood. You can't do it while it's cold because that cold air will just be spilling back down into the basement. So you have to warm it up uh, first and um, let it establish a good draft and then check it. So then that's how you check spillage. That's what spillage is. Now they're going to ask you what are some things that would cause spillage if you found you had spillage. Um, number one, first and foremost, is lack of combustion air. So if this thing's in a small room, this hole right here is just the hole that goes right up the vent. So if this thing's in a small room, it doesn't have enough air in that room, it's going to suck air down that vent in order to go in the burners and burn. And we want that because we don't, if we don't have enough combustion air, we're going to get flame rollout. It's going to catch the furnace on fire. So com lack of combustion air, first and foremost, that's number one. Number two would be a plug in the vent. Birds like to get in there in the summertime when you're not using it, build a nest in there. And then in the winter time, you go to use it and the vent's plugged and you'll get spillage out of the uh, draft hood. Uh, so lack of combustion air, a plug. And then the last one we can't do anything about, that would be if it's windy out and you got some wind blowing back down the vent, causing a backdraft. Okay, lastly, they're gonna ask you about Delta T. What is Delta T? Well, Delta T is the temperature rise of the air across the heat exchanger. Um, so you're going to basically measure the air coming in and the air going out. Now they might ask you, how do I know what proper Delta T is? And it's going to be on the furnace label, which is right back there behind the gas valve. You can see it behind the gas pipe there. It's kind of black and silver. It always says what the temp rise should be. Okay, zooming back out. They might ask you, why do I care about Delta T? Why does it matter? The answer is to make sure it's operating the way it was designed to, um, you know, by manufacturer specifications. Now they're going to say, how do you measure Delta T? Um, well, first you put a temperature probe down here in the return, anywhere in the return, it doesn't matter. Sometimes I throw it in the blower door compartment too. And you put a temperature probe up here in the supply but not really close. They want you to get, you see how that bends to the left? They want you to get up around the corner. And there's a reason for that. They want you to be over here around the corner, or if it doesn't bend, it goes straight up into like some sheetrock or whatever. Then they want you to get up as high as you can, uh, between four to six feet. Now the reason you do that and not right down here, because if you see, there's a hole right here that the students made, because they're not very smart, uh, it's too close to the heat exchanger. You'll get residual radiant heat off the heat exchanger. Uh, you won't get an accurate delta T reading. So your return, you put it anywhere. On your supply, it has to be up around the corner, around the bend, or as high as you can get it uh, in the basement or the closest register. Now, you're gonna measure it with uh, your temperature probes, you're going to compare it to the label. And if you're outside what the label says, the only way to fix it is adjust the airflow. Do not say adjust the gas because we already clocked the meter. Um, you adjust the airflow. So the easiest way to adjust the airflow is adjust the fan speed. Now on these furnaces, not so much these old pilot furnaces, but on modern furnaces, um, 
they have multiple speed fans in them and typically the heat runs on low speed the cool runs on high speed and then there's a couple extra speeds in there uh, for you to use for different purposes so if your delta t is too high you speed up the fan and if your delta t is too low you slow down the fan um, or in the case of airflow maybe you're going to add some duct subtract some duct um, if the delta if it's too hot delta t is too high give it more air not combustion air duct air and if the delta t is too low it's too cold you give it less air now the last thing they could ask you is if the delta t is too high you don't fix it what could happen um, it will crack our heat exchanger and void our warranty and if the delta t is too low and we don't fix it what can happen we're going to get condensation in the vent remember if we drop below 140 we're going to get condensation in our vent so um, that, that'll create rust it'll rust out the vent it'll rust out the heat exchanger so then they might ask you how to light a pilot and what is this thermocouple for this thermocouple here is your flame safety for your pilot um, it's to make sure that the pilot is actually lit if the pilot goes out it'll shut off the gas and it won't allow the the furnace to run and they'll probably ask you how to light a pilot so first you turn off the power to the unit then you come over here to this switch and it'll either be a push down or in this case it's a slide over you slide it over or you push the knob down you have to turn it to pilot first so this is your pilot position on and off so that's on and we're gonna pull it over here to pilot you'll either push it down or you'll flip it this case on this one flip it to the side and that's allowing gas to come out of that pilot tube then you follow this pilot tube down and it leads into the burners and you light it with a long lighter or um, like a match on a clip or something and you keep holding it as you see I keep holding it and you got to warm up that thermocouple once the thermocouple is warm you should be able to let go of that knob and your pilot will stay lit and then you turn it to the on position and you stand to the side and turn on the power